Hello, everybody, and welcome. I am very excited today today to be talking to Beard, the Arkham Horror custom content designer who has designed this Cyclopean Foundations that we're talking today, but also most notably uh, Alice in Wonderland, which I imagine a lot of people know that custom campaign because that was one of the first. But enough of my talking. Beard, how's it going? It's going well. Thanks for doing this interview with me. Yeah, I'm very excited. So before we get into Cyclopean, um, I wanted to talk a bit about... <laughs> I know the answer to this already because you're you're in our Discord and, and you, you share a lot of your 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 wisdom there, but you create a lot of Arkham Horror content, like a lot of it. And like why did you wanna start making custom content for this game is what I would love to know to start with. Well, that started with my friend who um, uh, I've known in real life since middle school mm -hmm. and he's the one who hosts our weekly tabletop group. And he was the one who introduced me to Arkham Horror, the card game. Mm -hmm. I'd known the second edition board game since I was in high school, but he showed off the card game and I really liked the mechanics. And after we played through Dunwich, I was starting to get ideas for what I'd like to see in the game. Mm -hmm. And after I played Carcosa and had my mind flipped <laughs> and scrambled, yeah. Then I knew I wanted to do some cool stuff with this game. So it was right about after I played Carcosa that I started getting ideas for Alice in Wonderland. Yeah. And honestly, I think I started getting ideas for Cyclopean around the same time because I remember some vague ideas about Cthulhu stuff mm -hmm. around the same time. I just decided to focus on Alice first. Mm hmm. I'm glad I did because it gave me design experience to make Cyclopean even better. Yeah, because um, I know we're like eventually there will be another uh, interview on the channel where we dive deeper into Alice in Wonderland together. But I know Alice in Wonderland is a little bit more. Um, it, this is like a more straightforward kind of strike st scenario structure in Cyclopean compared to Alice. Yeah, Alice was definitely my experimental phase. <laughs> Um, but it's, it's really cool because one of my favorite things about, um, your scenarios, especially now that I've played, like when I play, when I interviewed Axolotl and Jack Science, it was very much like, I was like, I've played these campaigns a few times and a few custom content. And I think this is really cool, but I've played a lot of your stuff. And what I really like is how you, um, kind of like each scenario has a very distinct story that you can feel in the mechanics of it. And what I really fell in love with the Cyclopean Foundations was how the the story was told through the scenario and like alice obviously also has a lot of that i think what i really liked about alice was like the story outside of the scenario your your writing was really good and i loved the mechanics of if you're helping or hurting wonderland affecting you which was really cool um but thank you yeah it's, it's one of the things too for uh I, I do these interviews for curiosity for my own sake because i i design my own board games in my own time and I love hearing how other people approach design and also like to help other wannabe designers for Arkham Horror or other board games kind of get like a footing. So with that said, I would just love to know like when you generally have an idea, of, like, like in like broad strokes, like a campaign to finish, like what's kind of like the process of like how you approach it? Well... That is an interesting question, and it sometimes depends on what I'm using uh -huh. for the um, the basis of the campaign. Uh -huh. If I'm adapting something like Alice in Wonderland, I usually go through and do a whole bunch of reading ahead of time, yep. and then decide like what in this story should be a scenario and what should be an interlude and what can I just not bother including if it's not important enough. That's cool. I like that. That's neat. So I sort of map out the story and figure out the story beats that have good player interaction and make those into scenarios. Mm -hmm. But for something like Cyclopean Foundations, it was completely original. Yeah. I basically just thought, what, what is a good way to progress things? So more like a choose your own adventure kind of thing where you mm -hmm. start at one point and like, what is the next logical step or what would be an interesting next step to make the story progress? Yeah. And it sort of evolved from start to finish rather than 
um, plotted, plotted all at once, uh, adapting from something. It's sort of more growing than mm-hmm. uh, building all at once. Yeah, and know, definitely kind of rambling. No, 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 it's all good. I'm the master rambler, so I get it. Um, it's it's something that I see in um, Cyclopean especially, and you see it in the official um, the official scenarios too. But like when it comes to if you're designing a custom thing, and it's like set pieces, right? So the introduction is doesn't need to be a spectacle, but then like I love how you have him going twice. There's like an immediate hook to it. It reminded me a lot of. Oh, by the way, uh, spoilers for people who haven't played Cyclopean, but I imagine if you've played Cyclopean, that's why you're here listening to this. But when I played um, Going Twice for the first time, this was ages ago. Like, I don't even remember when exactly. But I remember telling Travis the next day when he when he came to record Arkham, I was like, so I played this sick-ass auction scenario that was kind of like a more involved and like really like it, it was like the house always wins but bigger and it had this bidding mechanic that i thought was going to be so complicated but it played like so elegant when i actually played it and it's like that those set pieces that make the memorable story and what i really like is that like the majority of these scenarios have a really cool set piece like Clum- crumbling masonry you go into the masonic hall across dreadful waters you're on a boat and like you're getting like all these little things come on either side and then of course you're climbing on top of the volcano and then you know obviously the the big finale to it as well and i think the set pieces are are really cool and i imagine that's kind of like how you looked at the design of it too you're like how can i like what is the next like spectacle moment that comes from it right yeah that was definitely part of it yeah I wanted to make sure that people who are playing this not only like enjoy the story, but are like really eager for it. Yeah. Not just like, all right, let's get the next story beat out of the way so we can keep playing more like shit. What's going to happen next. Yeah. Yeah. And one thing, and this is going to going to lead into our next um, topic of conversation, but you have two mechanics in this campaign that are some of my favorite um like my top three if i had to point to campaign mechanics would be scan notice and and non-euclidean um so notice if you don't know it's basically just like a number that's tracked in your campaign log kind of like yig's fury and the more or less you have is kind of tells how much people notice you and then non-euclidean is a location-based thing where if you leave a location when you move from a location the investigator must resolve all non-Euclidean abilities on that location. So I want to start with notice. Like, where did notice come from? Because I imagine, and I'm curious, because where it kind of came in, like, because there's a big conspiracy act, um, part to the Cyclopean Foundations. Was it like notice came first and then conspiracy? Or was it like conspiracy and then notice? Like, I'm just curious where notice came from. The conspiracy came first. Mm-hmm. The notice mechanic was sort of me trying to figure out a good way to involve the the enemies that you have in the campaign which are like the sort of well it's like the cult and their shadowy agents mm-hmm. but i wanted a way for them to interact with the players more than just all oh, the cultists are out there chanting i guess we'll go bash their heads in yeah yeah it was more like because you are investigating this how well you do determines how much they gauge you as a threat yeah and And that and that seemed to really kind of drive the direction of the story yep so it was sort of it was it was a move both to develop the campaign story and the mechanics at the same time and sort of push things forward and and it's such a cool balancing mechanic too because it's like it flavorfully resonates and then like my first campaign, my first play of this, I got um, in the first scenario when there's notice. And it was like, if you got this much experience, mark a notice. And I was like, oh, I did so good. That's awesome. But now, like, I can tell that this is going to kind of balance out for it. And I think it's just really, it's really cool. And fits fits with the conspiracy part of it, too, really well. Yeah, I was very happy when I decided on that one. Yeah, and then, like, it's really cool. So, like, like, then there was, like, part of the process. You were also, like, this is going to how I'm going to balance the difficulty. If you're doing well, it's going to be a little bit harder. If you're doing worse, you can, like, that kind of, I just assume, just kind of came with the, the mechanic as it grew. Yeah. Yeah. I honestly wish I did stuff like that in more of my campaigns, but it's kind of hard to 
do that in a flavorful way in a Definitely. lot of cases. Yeah, and and I think that's why I like Notice so much because it is such a flavor home run and a mechanical home run too. Yeah, I can. Yeah, but it's hard. You can't just be like uh, in Alice in Wonderland, for example. You're starting. To, I mean, like you could like you're noticed by the the bad parts of Wonderland, but it doesn't like fit the same way it does in Cyclopean. Yeah. yeah. And it also provided a new design space for me because, yeah, the, the notice number keeps going up depending on how well you're doing. But mm -hmm. in every scenario, the way that notice is applied, I want that to be different just to keep people on their toes. Like, yeah. I think there's only one scenario where it affects the skull token mm -hmm. and one that changes what cards are in the encounter deck. I just wanted to make sure it was something interesting every time so it's not just like all right let's do this thing again yeah that thing that's that's a that's a really insightful tip too just like um how can you build off of your mechanic right that's not just the same thing each time yeah uh and what about non-euclidean how about where did that one come from non-euclidean came from the actual story called cthulhu because mm -hmm. In the story, the sailors land on the island, they go and find basically the Tomb of Cthulhu, and then he wakes up, they run for it, and a bunch of them start like falling through space that isn't there, mm -hmm. and that was kind of the, the inspiration for the mechanic. You can go somewhere, but when you try to leave, suddenly space is all screwy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that was just because I wanted the non-Euclidean stone to be the focus of the campaign because I thought that was the coolest part of Call of Cthulhu. Mm -hmm. I, I made that mechanic as simple and robust as I could because in general, I like really simple mechanics when I can. Mm -hmm. I mean, I know I go sometimes overboard because I like puzzly scenarios too, but mm -hmm. for I want the average person on the internet to be able to jump into this and play it without a tremendous amount of preparation and thought going into like okay i don't even understand how this plays i'll just go back to playing carcosa or forgotten age instead yeah yeah and um i mean that's what I, I think it's just and it's also just it's it's something that like i happens to me a lot when i'm streaming because you know i'm like talking to chat looking at numbers playing the game trying to also you know be somewhat entertaining but Chat like with is a non very big monkey on your back. Yeah. And but like with, with the simple mechanics, like especially like non-Euclidean, uh it it makes like it, it it doesn't have like a memory point where you need to like remember it. It's more like you leave the location and you're like, oh yeah, there's non-Euclidean here. I can resolve that now, right? Or like, ooh, do I leave? Or someone's like, oh, and then you, it's easy to rewind as well, right? So even if someone misses it, it's just nice and simple and they can just keep the game going. And it takes like a lot of stress off the player's mind, which if you're designing, you need to be very aware of what your players have to like experience while going through the scenario right exactly mm -hmm. um cool so also why cthulhu is what i'm also curious about so i mean obviously cthulhu is the big guy but is there any like other reason or is it just like the short story interests you all the whole arkham files or is there is there anything else it was a little of both mm -hmm. the the story interested me and then again like i said the the stone really interested me because like bending space and angles that don't meet up is really interesting. And uh -huh. Cthulhu being the focus of that was just sort of, all right, he he's the villain I'm going to use. Uh -huh. And it, and it kind of encouraged me to use it because there are none of the Arkham Horror LCG games at this point that use Cthulhu. Yeah. So it was sort of fresh territory and it was something I wanted to do. Uh -huh. Sick. Uh, were there any like a big, because I know in you you've said before that and at this point now you your first like draft is pretty close to final. Were there any like big design challenges or hiccups as you were going through this campaign? I rely a lot on player feedback for that because something that's kind of intuitive to me because I came up with it and something I can explain to my friends may not be the same for other people playing it on their own. Mm -hmm. So there are some like the final scenario that I had to redo a couple times just to make it not not so much understandable, but so like less of a mental tax to play. Yeah, yeah. But well, how many times do you think I played through the campaign before I released it to the public? Oh, that's a great. Okay, I want to say 
I'm going to say eight times. One for each scenario. Like, play each scenario eight times. Or at least the whole campaign, top to bottom. I played it through once. Oh, <laughs> okay, okay, cool. I love it. I love it. So, yeah, but I mean... I know, I, it's, it's, it's terrible advice for people who are making their own scenarios. You should always test things until you're at a place where they're satisfied. Yeah. But I think it's just because I'm familiar enough with the game that yeah. I can make a scenario that's pretty functional and the mechanics I make are simple enough that it's not going to completely destroy people's experience yeah at least that's the hope until luke robinson get involved <laughs> yeah that's a, that's what i've heard from from everyone now that luke robinson finds a way to break something eventually but i mean it makes sense because you just said that you're like you work best with other players feedback right so it would make sense that you want to get it out of your head asap and then out there into the community that'll play test it and give their feedback right that makes tons of sense exactly yeah and I do the best I can, but I want to make sure that I'm polishing a diamond and not a turd. Yeah, yeah. And, like, it is one of those things, too, that, like, I I don't think there's anything... I don't think there's anything wrong to, like, either approach. But I think the one thing that every um, everyone I've interviewed has said is that you also have to, like, stop, right? So I think, like, rather than trying to, like make something perfect just get something that's like you don't there's nothing broken that happens in your camp in your campaign send it out to people and then everyone will be like okay this broke or hey you have these many spelling errors because that happens literally every time i send someone any design they're like did you notice a spelling error and i'm like well now i did and it's better to just it, get it out right it happens all the time like yeah. if i want things to be perfect i would still be working on wonderland yeah yeah i'm not kidding they're like two years after i decided to call it finished there are people still sending me like, oh, by the way, you missed a spelling error here. Yeah. And I just have to clench my fist and say, super. Yeah. Yeah. Congrats. You win a prize. You win a prize. You found it. Yeah. It was a secret just for you. <laughs> Sick. Any other um, thoughts or just general things about um, Cthulhu, the story that you want to get on? Or should we just dive in and look at the scenarios? Because there's some good stuff in here. I think we should just dive in because if I think of anything broad, I can just bring it up while we're talking about the scenarios. Uh, one thing I will say that um, Beard gave me advice when I was streaming once and I was working on some ideas for uh, a custom campaign of my own. Uh, Beard said that, uh, I don't know if you do this for everything, but you said that you start with the generic encounter sets. And that was such good advice for me because it let me then start to mechanically put things together with my vague ideas in kind of like a broad perspective, which was really helpful. So if you're stuck on a campaign, I suggest you do that. It, it worked very well for me. Yes. So that I do that for pretty much all of my works. Mm -hmm. I always start with the general encounter sets because it, it helps define things both mechanically and in the story. Mm -hmm. So if I, ha if I have something in a general encounter set, I know I don't have to cover that in a single scenario. Mm -hmm. And it also helps shape the story because like at the same time, when I finish the general encounter sets, I decide I want to use each of them like three or four times. Mm -hmm. So I divide them up to thematically fit each oh, of the scenarios. Yeah. And based on what I have in each scenario, it kind of can shape the story further. Like, all right. I, if I'm using Dunwich, for example, I've got like Bishop's thralls. I've got sorcery. I've got, um, I don't know, some of the other weird things going on, but I've got none of like the Dunwich sorted and silent and I've got none of the mm -hmm. whippoorwills that lets me know that's going to be a more magically focused scenario than it's yeah. going to be like something in, taking place in Dunwich and focused on the town. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. That's, that's, I like that. That's a, that's a cool approach too. Cause then it, you might get story discoveries that you weren't even thinking about in an initial plan too. And if you want to like reuse a, uh, a set more than once, like, I've got this set that I'm only using for two encounters. If I use it in another scenario, mm -hmm. then that changes the story a little bit. Is that something I want or not? Yeah. Cool. Awesome. All right. Lost Moorings. So um, this one, as it, as it loads in, uh, has a lot of things that I, I really like. And the first one is that it's just in Arkham. I, I have a soft spot for scenarios that are just in Arkham. Uh, and the second one is just that it's 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 raining. I love <laughs> the rain. <laughs> and the mood on this one's really cool. And it's why it's probably my favorite 
opening scenario in a custom campaign. Um, it's just really like, it just tells the story in a really cool, moody way. And I really like that. Yeah, that's exactly what I wanted for this scenario. I wanted it to just be kind of like a kind of an eerie opener. It's not mm-hmm. like something bombastic. You're not being thrown right into the the gunfire and explosions. Mm-hmm. It's something strange going on. Yeah, because, because the the conspiracy is behind this. They're trying to keep this quiet. They're just trying to keep things out of the way until they can accomplish whatever goal they're working on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so as you're peeling the onion, you're trying to go slow. So you're trying to find exactly where the, the brown spots are. Yeah, yeah. And then I like how it kind of resolves. Just kind of like looking through the encounter deck. I'm going to pull out some cards. Um, Where's that one? There's like one guy who... I think it's this guy, the Wharf Rat. I like the story that like it... Um, you can like, you know pay the guy off right to get out of here to like stop paying attention to you and that one's a that was not even a scenario specific one that's just uh from one of the sets yeah we're afraid it's fun because he might have seen something but whether or not he has he still just doesn't like your face yeah 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 and then like there's the stuff which is uh the this the the designs on these battering waves, right? Where if you fail, you take a damage move to connecting the lo- uh, location with the lowest shroud value. Um, it's what I like about designs like this is that it's punishing not too much and it can sometimes be beneficial, but it also sometimes might trigger set mechanic of non Euclidean, right? Which is really cool as well. Exactly. Especially mm-hmm. once you get the, the boat into play, that's going to sweep you overboard. Yep. Yeah. And then you're just like, out there in the water just trying to pull out some of these other ones stuff this is just like generic set stuff like the whole cold trail and then there's the 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 shift halfway when you get on the boat right uh the boat's over here <laughs> yeah let's move these guys out of the way there we yeah. go. um but with the boat then you get on there and you get the first bit of the non-euclidean hook as you step inside because like none of these other locations have the non-euclidean because it's not like it's 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 as you said like when you're unraveling the onion you get to this point where the boat is like the first big what the heck is going on right exactly i wanted this to be the only non-euclidean thing because i wanted it basically to be an introduction to the mechanic that people could understand but i wasn't going to punish them for not understanding it well other than maybe losing a victory yeah yeah and i think it's a it's a cool um non-euclidean because like there's it's not hurting you right but it provides a puzzle for the player to solve which is really cool right yeah because you got to figure out your movement to make sure that you end the scenario with nobody having to move from the main deck yep and then also like the to read the interlude it's saying no you want to put some clues on this right you want to put some clues on this but you also want to get those clues off of it which is really cool yeah yeah uh so when this was designed because this uh, the the evidence in the interludes because there's not many campaigns like it's really like insmith that kind of has that um was this designed before i don't know like when this was designed in comparison to the the full campaigns like when those all were released i think this was designed just before insmith because mm-hmm. i know Dream Eaters was coming out when I was working at Alice and mm-hmm. I deliberately avoided playing it because I knew there was an irritating cat and didn't want to yeah. <laughs> have any overlap. Yeah. And I worked on Cyclopean right after this and it was just before Innsmouth came out. Because I remember I was working on this when I saw the Innsmouth announcement. I'm like, oh crap, are they going to use Cthulhu? Okay. That's... And then I found out later on they don't. So I'm like, all right, I'm, I'm fine. I'm not as worried about the overlap now. Yeah, it's it's kind of funny how things work like that. Like at the same time, Edge of the Earth, Betrayal, and Mountains of Madness, right? Like, yeah, I remember Jack's having a scramble once he found that they were doing Edge of the Earth next. He was like, "All right, I got to kick into high gear. I got to finish this. I got to polish this now." Yeah, yeah. I mean, but it's but... it's cool to see different perspectives of the mythos, right? Like I, that's what I like about it, because, um, like Edge of the Earth is very surface level, and Betrayal gets pretty deep into the mythos. Like it gets really into it. 
Oh yeah, Jax goes way into the lore, probably further than any official product ever has. Yep, yep. Um, any... But when it came to the interludes there, yeah. that was mainly my my love of like mysteries and actually uncovering things that oh, made yeah. me do that. Because I could have just gone, when you get spend three per clues as a group, just put a resource on there, and if there's X resources, advance. But... I, I like the story. I want people to actually feel like they're uncovering the mystery yeah. rather than just, okay, we got four clues for investigator check mark onward. Yes. Yeah. No, and it, it, it like from my perspective, when I played it the first time, it, it very much gave a moment where I was like, I need to do all of these. Like I need to uncover this mystery. Right. So like it's a, it, if that was your goal, then it was a, it was a, you hit it out of the park. Cause that is, it's exactly the vibe for it. Right. That's exactly what I hope for. Yeah. And there's a lot of cool things too, where I like, like the, the simple stuff, right. Where down here and like, it, it allows the players to structure their turns to solve this, like going back to the puzzle, and the mystery, the, the middle, the main deck, the non-Euclidean. Cause this is kind of like, like while there's all this rain, the, the conspiracy and all that, the hook of this campaign is like figuring out the mystery on these three cards, like trying to get them work. And then also figure out the puzzle of the non-Euclidean, but there's like small little things where like in two player, for example, the main deck will, you want player clues on it. And then maybe those player clues you can use to go into the engine room, right? Or you can use the clues from the engine room if you come there first. And there's a lot of cool ways to approach it, but it kind of like, they kind of just kind of like fit together, right? Which is really nice. Yeah. And I like these more compact sections mm -hmm. uh, that, well, I think, uh, locations got a bit too expensive with Innsmouth and Edge of the Earth. I just kind of like more, yeah, tighter, more condensed rest. things, yeah. so it doesn't cater to a specific kind of investigator. That's also something I really have to focus on when I'm designing, is making sure that all right, I know that the the Daisy Walkers and the Mark Harrigans are going to go through this, but is, is everybody going to be able to do okay at this yes yeah how do you like how do you approach that kind of thing like the balance of the general pool of investigators it's just like you just you just kind of forget you kind of like just pretend the mark harrigans tony morgan's daisy walkers don't exist i kind of do in a sense yeah because like when i was doing the test of uh colorado of oz recently with my friends mm -hmm. one of my friends wanted to play mark harrigan so when we were playing through, he was having a really easy time at combat, but I kind of had to keep in my mind, like, this isn't going to be the average yeah. fighter experience in this. So if he says it's too easy, it's probably about where it should be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, like, I know, I forget what my first run of this was, but my second run I had um, Parallel Agnes and Bob. And Bob was slow going and then kind of just before he was tabooed with the things he kind of got through. But like Agnes struggled, right? So it's like, it's true. Like not everyone is just going to be able to breathe. Like you get someone like, like I think you even said this in, in our, in our discord once where it was like, someone said my campaign was too easy, but they came through with like a 80 experience Cyclopean hammer deck. So I'm like, what do you want me to do? <laughs> right. Yeah. Like you can, you can play the game however you want, but I'm not going to balance it around your amazing power run. Yeah. And I think that's an important aspect and um, for all designers who are kind of looking at this is that you should keep that in mind where you should skew a little bit easier or um, alternatively really hammer down on the mechanic. This is something that I imagine one day I'd love to talk to you about them in a video, but like the Arkham Incident stuff, like in the Dario one where it's very resource dependent. So you just really strain the resources for the players, right? Like that's a way that you can do it as opposed to just making every number big, right? Like target areas and then twist the knife in those areas, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Those were also very fun challenges just to fit the theme of every uh, ally in that, but we can talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm thinking I'm playing the Olive McBride on uh, Friday. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, anything else for this one? Because I think that I've kind of covered all of my things that I wanted to talk about here. Not much else to talk about. Um, it's a pretty simple scenario, but yes. I think that's the best way to do an opener because most people are going in with few expectations in a level zero deck. I guess one one question too is how do you approach designing 
a hook for your opening scenario because this is something that like it's it's pretty important that you have like a good hook. So hook. Do you just try to like is that like at this point it's like you don't even think about it or you do you actively try to like find a good narrative or like mechanical hook to your opening scenario? That is a good question. Mm -hmm. I know I like to get players involved in the story as early as possible. Yeah. So with the introduction of this just being you're hired by James Wycliffe to go find this boat. Mm -hmm. That's that's a pretty simple thing that nobody needs to like really know a whole bunch of mythos or yeah. stretch their mind around like, well, why would they he contact me about this? It's just like, no, he just he wants some outside investigators to find his boat that's it yeah and that's just the the diving board here mm -hmm. yeah, but it's not always the case depending on the campaign because i'm trying to think of better examples um uh, i guess i'll just have to skip that and come back to it i don't yeah, want to waste yeah, no worries. Time i mean it's it. hard because i imagine for you at this point now you kind of just like you just like a first scenario isn't that much different to you than like a fourth scenario in a way right because of all, all the stuff you've designed at this point now right yeah. i think i actually went through and list everything i've made and i think i'm averaging about one scenario a month since i started holy cow that's really good <laughs> that's really impressive <laughs> it's a little extreme yeah oh geez just mess up the camera all right let's go to the auction house i'll just delete all this Oh, All right. Why, why have I forgotten to use Tabletop Simulator suddenly? All right. Going twice. So this is a really cool scenario. Um, I just would like... So it's, it's all about the auction with the O'Banions, right? The O'Banions are there for this one? Yep. They're the ones in charge. Yeah. Uh, where did this one come from? I'd love to just know, like, the story and your idea behind this one. Now, this one's actually kind of funny because this was the last scenario to enter the story. Because I still hadn't started any of the scenarios, but mm -hmm. originally you went straight from the boat to mm, his house. Um, his house. Yeah. And it didn't feel quite right, and it only had like seven scenarios worth. And originally, Power Classic Flow was going to be split into two scenarios. There was going to be the boat ride and then the volcano. Mm -hmm. But I eventually decided to combine those because there wasn't a whole lot of material to keep them separate. Yeah. Like it wasn't any big reason to keep them separate. It could just be two parts of the same scenario. Uh -huh. And I went back and thought, well, what could be a good go between, between the, um, the, 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 the riverfront and Wycliffe's house. And that's when I thought to involve the O'Banions more because I knew they were just kind of a side plot essentially in this. Yeah. And came up with the auction house because that's that's where they keep their valuables. And I developed a whole scenario just from that need to fill a hole. And what I think is really cool is that it actually kind of gives your uh, campaign a three-act structure, right? Like, there's the whole um, Wycliffe part in the opening. Then we get into, like, traveling the world and the, the Masons. And then it ends with, like, oh, okay, actually, here is, you know, here is Cthulhu land, right? Which is really cool. So, yeah, yeah, and that also helped with the non-Euclidean because I still wanted to not jump into non-Euclidean right away mm -hmm. and make it, I think it's just one location yeah. and this one again, because I want things to get steadily more crazier, basically, the closer you get to really a... Yeah, which is really, uh, I think, works really well. Yeah, because then there's, like, these locations up here um, uh, with uh, just some, you know, named O'Banions, which was really cool. And then, yeah, the non-Euclidean, I believe, is just in the the vault, right? Which makes sense, because this is where the stone was being held, right? Yeah, and there's still a lot of leftover yeah. distortion from it. It's, it's, it's intentionally left vague, just for mystery's sake. Heck yeah, heck yeah. Um, but I, I like coming up with characters. I think I enjoy writing characters the most when I write a story. Uh -huh. So in the first scenario, there was uh, Bill Bledsoe, the big mean son of a gun. and Yeah. Thomas Rabiki, the, the stoker, just got caught in the wrong place. And this one, we have Ernie Vickers, the loan shark, and Nora Shanley, the broker. Yeah. Th there wasn't really any precedence for them. I just made up people that would just fit. Yeah. And so it, it gives this, it also gives this, the locations life that 
does and mechanically complicate things, right? Like, this reminds me of um, cheating in The House Always Wins or, like, stealing from the uh, front of house in Carcosa, which we really don't see that much of as anymore that I can think of off the top of my head, you know? Like, the, the world-building, atmospheric interactions, right? Yeah, I love those, and I really need to add those more into my campaigns because even I'm guilty of skimping on them when I get involved. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's hard to be, you know, aware of them. And this is the one also where at the beginning, like, you can have your weapons taken away, right? Yeah, this was fun because it's it's kind of like Call of Cthulhu RPG in a way. Yeah. Because you get to choose how you want to approach this gangster-run auction house. You can play along, you can be sneaky, you can try and divert attention, but each one has its own effects that more or less balance out to be the same. Yeah, which is, yeah, and it, it's, it's cool. Like, and then, like, yeah, because you can, you can see it here in the, the, have it on the screen for you at home. It's, you can uh, cooperate, cause a ruckus, or f took time to find another way in, which is, uh, and you get to start in, like, a different room if you, if you sneak in, which is really cool. Yeah, you start just, like, in this display room as opposed to the private lobby. Yeah, you found a side entrance. Yeah. And then one thing I like, too, is that, um, there's like still like kind of like a story on each loca uh, location as well. One, th one thing that I, I've heard some people talk about and I never actually realized when it comes to building locations, how like each location has text on it. Because uh, like it got me thinking like why I, I was like, are there locations with no text on it? But no, like there's not that I can think of apart from like resign, which is the closest to no text. I think there's only like two that don't have anything. And one of them is just like, your study in the very first scenario yeah. in the whole game. Yeah. It's kind of wild. But yeah, just just something to add flavor or at least give the player something to do that's different from their normal cycle. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then I like the stuff where it's like, you know, you can, just, like, the, the stories that it tells you, like, you sell something of yours for uh, information. You can, um, like, show something, right? Like, you know, you... You, you give something in the display room and everyone's like, oh, look at all this. It makes it easier to find stuff. And then up here, there's the auction assets, which uh, I just love the kind of like the small little story you tell with each of them because they don't matter, right? Like, Not, not essentially. I mean, yeah. you can you can buy them all or you can ignore them all. And I was, I was trying to focus on you doing it just as an alibi, but most people just got them because there was an opportunity to get them and they were kind of confused about why mm -hmm. I gave more victory for just keeping up appearances. But that, that, I think that was a little bit of a miss on my part. I should have made it more apparent that you're, you're just trying to keep up appearances. Yeah. No, on the other fair. hand, you can also just take the Preston Fairmont. I'll take the lot. Yep. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I really like the kind of the, um, I just like seeing, like, it's fun to me to see what comes up. It's like, oh, it's the Baroque painting, right? Yeah, it just adds a little more than just like, all right, there's another item up for auction. It doesn't matter what it is, but yeah. having, having the variety, also a variety of costs just to keep people from being, like, predicting what's going to happen next. Yes, definitely, yeah. And, and something that a lot of people actually miss is that each of these has a printed cost, these auction assets actually count for the action on smoking lounge where you're basically showing off your most valuable assets. Oh, look at that. <laughs> I actually, I missed that too. That's really funny. So you can just like buy them in base and then just come in and be like, look at this. I get plus five. Yeah. You've got the best item that was up for, for grabs. Yeah. You're going to be showing that off and people yeah. are going to be impressed. And then everyone's like, wow, wow. That's so cool. <laughs> that's, that's actually really funny. I like that. I like that. Um, and then also up here, there is the countermeasures, which is kind of like uh, the first big step of the notice mechanic, right? In scenarios? Yeah, that was the one that was a bit more standard, just to have something people knew to watch out for, even if they didn't know everything that notice was going to do. Yeah. And I tried to tailor it. I mean, there's always going to be some misses, and in retrospect, some of them like counterplay being an anti... Um, emergency cash maybe it probably should have been two resources but mm. that's just where it happened to end when i put the the final stamp on it yeah yeah i can imagine especially yeah stuff like that can be a little bit like the balance of it is 
is tough, but it's also like, yeah, no, that that's yeah tough to figure out. I'm just kind of looking to see what like what the survivor one do. Place two cards in your, yeah, yeah, I think that's fair, but I do like it because it makes it feel also like kind of personal, you know. Yeah, and th- this was another way that I wanted the uh, to show that the the conspirators knew who you were and they were trying to counter you specifically. Yes. Yeah. Cool. And wow. the non Euclidean thing here was just making it much more irritating than the one on the boat. Yeah. So you so you knew what to watch out for in the future. Yeah, and it, and it's like it's like a, a scaling up, right? Like what's worse than nothing? Losing a resource or discarding a card, right? Yeah. Yeah. And it makes it spooky too, especially like when you if you ever have to move out of these like more than once, it creates a nice little stress point. And then was there something on Oh no, that's yeah, that's just how you you get through there at the last little bit. Yeah, and you and that's actually optional. If you're really in a crunch, you can just get out of there. You don't have to talk to the broker, but it's it's extra victory and it helps in the next scenario a little. Yeah, definitely. Cool. All right, should we move on to private lives? Sure. This one is like I've I've this one's like one of my uh nemesi scenario i always forget and i always have a very rough gameplay time with this one and that's just because like i'm an idiot <laughs> and i forget i was like yeah let's do this and then it has well, it so this... a difficult side compared to the previous two yeah definitely yeah it's like uh the first little like punch in the face for it um so there's the notice which just changes like how the agenda deck works but but also i believe is where this whole mechanic comes in with the tiktok man yeah, the TikTok men, they were a pretty early addition because I'd played plenty of Eldritch Horror and they mm-hmm. were just one of the more interesting characters from that. Yep. Because it seems like every time I play with my friends, they show up just by random chance. Yeah. But just, like, where do they, don't they sit on like just near Australia or something like that? Yeah, they just sit in the outback taking everyone's clues and that's pretty much what they're doing here. They're trying to erase all the clues. Yep. Yeah, flavorfully, it's really cool. And I love the hyper zoomed in version of the art from the scan of Elder Toro. Yeah. I wish they had an art repository somewhere. Yeah. It's it's a shame they just had to zoom far in on the cardboard token. Yeah, that's that's one thing you always say. And as someone who also tries to source temporary art or as in this case kind of like permanent art for the custom stuff, don't underestimate how hard it's gonna be to find art. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I know there have been scenarios that I have spent longer finding the art than designing the whole scenario. Yeah. Yeah, and, and usually you usually have, like, some nice stuff. And that's where I was actually going to say that for the, the auction house. It must be nice to just, like, for finding things, you're just like, I don't know, like a Baroque painting, and there's just, like, millions of pictures for you to find, and you're just, like, easy. Yeah, and there's others. I think you were the one talking about it in, um, when you were, when, uh, you were showing up the Circus X Mortis cards. <laughs> It is incredibly difficult to find a picture of just somebody running. I don't know yeah, why. It is. It's so hard. They just don't exist. <laughs> but, but these are serviceable. Just pretend they're looking at you through a screen door. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, with this one, how like uh, how was your approach to trying to figure out, like, what, what made you want to, like, say, like, the design for these guys with less notice and the design for these guys with more notice? Because obviously, like, flavorfully it makes sense right like they're more apparent if you have more notice and less if you have don't but mechanically how did you kind of approach that well mechanically i wanted it to fit the flavor too it was if you're at low notice they the the organization only sends a few guys after you because they're not that worried but if you've got a ton of notice you are priority threatened they're going to send their whole squad after you at once yeah so rather than just a group of guys taking care of things going through the house they're going to send enough guys to fill the whole house and try and take care of this right now. Yeah. Oh yeah. And I forgot this one has like the, cause it's, they show up on the, yeah, they show up on the act flip. Yeah. And this one has a simple old, good old classic one actor. You got to love the good old one actors. Yeah. The, the midnight mask special. Yeah. And actually, you know, you're, you're, you're actually hundred percent because this is kind of just like six flip over enemy appears, right? Yeah, I guess these are the Masked Hunter. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and this one is just... broke, don't fix it. No, exactly. Like, that's actually one thing with... I remember I was playing the 
second scenario and call the plague bearer and i was like i'm pretty sure we're gonna see an enemy here on this flip because it is basically just midnight mask it's a great scenario and just it's a great threshold six doom is a good chunk of time for players to get settled get going start advancing the story and then you're like here is the big hook to this scenario now it's the big old boss right yep and the previous two didn't really have boss characters so this was a good opportunity to throw something in yeah and really then also once again hammers home the whole notice mechanic yeah yeah because at this point you're finally getting to a place where the amount of notice isn't going to be like we did great or we did terrible in the last scenario now you've got two scenarios so there's mm -hmm. a bit more modularity to how much notice you're going to have and this is where it starts to get a bit more uh involved with the planning of how much scenario or how much notice you have for the scenario for certain things to kick off yeah yeah definitely and all i need to do is just remember next time that if i have a lot of notice they're going to be at every location <laughs> and be prepared for that yeah and i actually liked this design well enough that i used it in oz as oh, like cool. an actual mechanic itself oh sweet so if you ever get around to playing that, you'll see. But I added pervasive, which just means they're at every scenario or at every location following the, the dash. Neat. Cool. That's cool. Um, yeah, but this one I think is pretty... There's It's just exploring the house, which is really cool. And because this is a house built by an architect who knows some of the non-Euclidean stuff, yep. this is where it starts to... like This has the specific location there, but also adds the set... Which has probably the most famous treachery in the oh, yeah. campaign, which starts shunting you around places that you shouldn't be able to get to. Yeah, which one's that one again? I'm just trying to find it. Um, this one, the warp stonework. Warp stonework. That's the one. So it just attaches, and you can go anywhere except where it's connected. Yes. And that was something I had to be aware of when I was designing scenarios with this encounter set. Like I had to make sure that. No matter where you draw this, there's always at least one other location you can go to. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, good call. I, I, I kind of like this, though, because it's kind of like, you're all Luke Robinson. Go, go, my children. You're all Luke Robinson in this campaign. <laughs> that was the way to get around Luke Robinson. When, when everybody's Luke Robinson, no one will be. Yeah. There's also some uh, some of these, uh, the from these ones, the, the set for these enemies. I remember there being some that are like, they're like I, th I like them because they're they're some that are like kind of actually spooky i'm sure i remember too i probably don't like spook but which one actually was the spooky ones but like i love this guy too because he's kind of just like um there's so much flavor in this guy but he's he's basically just an acolyte right for the most part like he's that thing that you got to solve um but you don't you don't have to like panic solve him he's not like they're gonna kill you immediately right right he's yeah. a problem but not one that's bearing down on your neck that's the fixer's problem <laughs> yeah 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 and yeah he can get big and, and this is one that you told me too is just like three attack and three health is actually a lot for a generic set so just like don't do too much of those right and i think that's very fair because three health actually is a good chunk like you can definitely have a bunch of them but for generic sets it's good to have two health enemies right yeah, it's it's definitely something you have to balance when you're plotting a campaign is that three health enemies are going to be two actions up until about halfway. Yeah. Then then you can get some tech the, to reliably take out three health enemies in one hit. And after that, it's the four health enemy that's guaranteed to be two actions to get rid of. Yeah. Unless you have something incredible like um, Holy Spear or... The um, good old cyclopean hammer just whacking yeah. everything yeah just oh, that's still just, true yeah just pulverize them into dust the instant you hit it <laughs> yeah sweet all right I was playing a bit more with hidden mechanics here just having a dude in your hand yes yeah that's really cool yeah i like that because he's just like he's, he's like here to finish you right like he's just like your friend yep and he you don't know where he is but he's he's nearby and he's ready to fire yeah, and the arsonist also is a spooky enemy, too. There's a lot. I remember this guy. He can just show up at the wrong time, and you're like, oh, no. But... Yeah, he's he's very tricky, but hopefully because um, because you have the choice, if you can at least get his yep. location, you can ignore the doom in that respect. Yeah, exactly right. And like I think this goes to something that everyone said, where it's like 
like look at compared to like warp stone uh stonework where it's not a bad card you need cards that are like not every one of your treachery cards can be haymakers you gotta have some that are kind of just there but the thing about what's nice about warp stonework is that in the wrong time this card can absolutely be a nightmare right but most of the time you're like you can use it to your advantage or it's nothing you're just like going to get rid of a card but, right because yeah. if, if you get it like here it's like yeah i can go to pretty much any other room in the house this is great but you get it here and then you have like the little side room that's only connected here is like oh crap i can't yep. get there yep now i gotta either get rid of this or hope this shows up in another location yeah <laughs> Yeah, because then also it, what what I love about that it's like it's like kicking the can down the road, and eventually you might never be able to solve that. Someone you have to come all the way back, which is really I think, like not an impact in the moment treachery, but it's a treachery that's going to eventually be like, "Hi, I'm here. How's it going?" I think that's something that's I've grappled with in the past. I've tried to make encounter sets where not every enemy is a hunter because they just slap that on every enemy to make sure it's a consistent problem. Yeah, because I know there are scenarios where it's if you can ignore an enemy once and leave a location they're just gone for good you can just leave them there for the rest of the game if they don't <laughs> have hunter and i played a little around with that in jumanji because mm -hmm. i know like when you were playing the third scenario you had the gorillas in their own little rumpus room there and you're yeah, like right, little it's, party just room, be, yeah. <laughs> it's just gonna be their room i'm gonna let them have it yeah yeah <laughs> so and i like that because like uh it's kind of like just kind of like builds those fun stories too right we're just like, I'm going to dodge the gorilla, and the gorilla's not going to hunt for me. He's just going to hang out in this room. And because it's kind of a small condensed map, that's one way to play around. But in any case, it's it's a design space thing that's a little tricky just because of the way the game has evolved. Yeah, definitely. Okay, let's go on to Crumbling Masonry. Which was... Uh, really, I really like this scenario. My first time through, I did really well. My second time, I got crushed. Uh, which I think is a sign of a good scenario. <laughs> where, you know, you can get that Arkham variance. Or too much <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, yeah. this one was a, a bit more directly Midnight Masks. But it was my way of giving you antagonists that you could like actually focus on but at the same time not have it be the same guys every time so yeah. there's no mystery yeah and then there's the this one is actually one of my favorite ways that i applied um notice it was just it's the same thing but it takes more actions to get rid of depending yes. on how noticed you are yeah which i think is really which is really nice yeah because also like uh, the, the downside of this card is not, like, crazy bad. So, like, if it's there forever, you're not going to lose, right? But, right, you just have to be more careful about how you play. You've got to make sure if you're moving in on a cultist, you better be able to deal with that doom right away. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, like, if you're going to keep it, you need to always be, like, just so you know, <laughs> there's there might be some situations where we need to, like, really solve a problem quickly. Yeah. And then what I like about this, the, the the bottom one, is that you're like, it's one action, I'll get to it eventually, and then suddenly you're like, man, I should have got to this three turns ago, right? <laughs> uh, the the constant lure of the action economy. Yeah, yeah. The, and then I love the whole, I love, one of my favorite things is, uh, it's like how in uh, Blood on the Altar, who's going to get sacrificed besides Earl Sawyer? Who, which one of these old white men are going to betray me, right? Like... These we, fucking geezers, you know they all they're all suspicious of you, but who are you suspicious of? Yeah. And I like to like call the shot and try to guess, you know? And like the the story it allows like the players to build a story. You know, it's once again like them being here obviously like because like they're like dealt out to like the locations. Yeah. And they're all kind of irritating, so it's almost satisfying in a way as just like uh, this guy that makes it so you can't move in or out on the same turn is like, alright, he's the enemy. Now I can get back at him for that yeah 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 because then like mechanically they kind of follow the same kind of thing right their evil version yeah like they have like a similar sort yeah like it's the same sort of kind of like idea like it's not like the one-to-one -one, but there's like inspiration in it that they're kind of the same guy yeah like yeah. this guy's sort of restricting your movement and afterwards he just 
keeps moving. Yeah, on he his ba- own. yeah, he basically gets the movement back that he restricted from you. And then there's the the Luther Lynch, which kind of like fits in like the flavor, but also what you were saying earlier in the um the auction one where it tells the story, right? Like this is another story character that tells the story because you can like how you approach him and then he can eventually like you know help you because you've convinced him what's happening in the order yeah this was a case of trying to bring story to people that they might not know because i had to do a bit of research about the masonic order and its Mm -hmm. structure and how it operates and actually each of the pictures on these locations is from the actual grand lodge in philadelphia no that's cool i lucked out that they actually have a tour page with a bunch of images of their rooms up. that's awesome yeah and even the layout is how it's laid out in the oh that's really cool in the that's actual cool. world because i found on wikimedia there's actual blueprints for the building that they themselves uploaded just because it's like a, a architectural work of art that they're proud of mm-hmm. that's awesome so that's i was really able cool. to see the layout of the building and kind of build it from there that's that's cool i like that but back to Luther Lynch, I had to look up the structure of the Masonic Order and sort of the history. Yeah. And there actually is a, a title in there called the Tyler of the Grand Lodge. Yeah. Who's sort of the defender, the security keeper. And it makes sense they wouldn't want any outsiders in because that's how they operate in real life. Yep. They don't want people prying into Masonic business. But when you're like, no, seriously, there's some cult stuff going on right here. He's like all right, it's my job to take care of this, and if there's actually cult here, then I might need some help. Yeah, and, I, no, and it's really cool, and I, I love the kind of the... it, And then it, it has a thing where it's like, you can fight him, but then there's like, you like double... Uh, you double point. It's like, hey, here are like, this is what you want to be doing, you know? Because you'll get this cool side character to help you in the scenario. Yeah, it's a fun little extra thing, and it's not taking up any slots of people who are just having them along for the ride if they can remember to move them, because I remember I always forgot to. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> sounds like me too. I probably definitely did that as well. Um, Yeah, no, but I really like this scenario, and it's stressful too, because I'm curious about when I play it a third time uh, with a team that doesn't have a mystic fighter. I'm curious to see if I'm able to handle the stress of enemies, because this is where I was like, okay, I need to reevaluate my Agnes deck. But I remember my first time through, like I said, I actually got all three of them like defeated. And I was like, okay, this went really well. And But I, what I in, super enjoyed was that they, the ones that you didn't defeat, because I didn't defeat any of them on my second playthrough, they come back at the end, but it's not... Uh, you did such a thing where it's not like the Devourer below, where you're like, now you die. It's more like yeah. they're here to annoy you, but you're not their grand purpose anymore, which was really cool. Yeah, and I wanted to also space it out because if, like, only one or two of them escape, then none of them show up in Blood from Stones because they've got other things to work on. Yeah. But if, like, all three of them escape, they can spare a guy to hassle you here. Yeah, yeah. Cool. That helps space it out so you're not... Also, like, there's a max of three, and there's, in Devour Below, there's a chance you can see, like, six guys there that you gotta somehow deal with. Man, especially, could you imagine the masked hunter showing up there? You're like, oh, no. (laughs) And then you draw the ghoul priest. Yep. Yeah, just looking through the cards, seeing the stuff that's there. There's these guys that are also not... It's crazy to see, because I feel like they fit so well with the flavor, but this goes back to what you were saying earlier, where you put them in and kind of like say I want these guys here and it kind of like fits with the whole thing you know like it, yeah. it, it kind of like dictates the flavor of the scenario a bit more which is really cool. yeah I, I really wanted it to show that like it, it's it's a significant portion of these intellectuals that you're up against it's not all just secret agents hired to kill you there yeah. are some there's some smart people you're up against yeah all right, uh, let's go to Across Dreadful Waters, which is probably, uh, the scope on this scenario is insane. Like, <laughs> yeah, it's it's considerable, and it's definitely a fan favorite just because of how how much player choice and yes. uh, replayability it has. And believe it or not, when I was plotting it out the first time, there was actually a fourth route, but because oh. there were so many cards that went into three, I decided to 
step back from that. Yeah, three is good. I think three is good. I, I've done two of them. So, because there's the... Do you visit any of the same locations on any of the routes, or is each route their own unique thing? Each is different. You either go from uh, Gibraltar to Port Said in Egypt to Bombay. Yeah. Or you can go from the Canary Islands to Cape Town to Zanzibar. Mm -hmm. Or you can go Panama to Suva, which is on Fiji, to Sydney. Mm Mm-hmm. And the other one that I decided to scrap eventually was taking a train cross country to San Francisco, then from there to Hawaii and then Tokyo. Oh, wild. Yeah. But you may be seeing San Francisco in the future. Let's go. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, this one is wild. Like, you have basically three, you basically have like nine scenarios here. Just about. Yeah. <laughs> so and. Like- and they each all have their own, like, thing, which is even, like, wilder, right? Where Yeah, it... each one was, uh... I think... Yeah, let me just recall this one then. Yeah, so you, you start in Kingsport either way, which I just looked at the Arkham Horror 2nd Edition sideboard for a vague layout of the districts. Yeah. Just like that one, and make it through. But then, like, um... It's, it's like not one of those things which is which which blew my mind where it's like each route it's like you visit three scenario three locations and then each of those locations are basically just a different like say like for example in like the direct route um s- scenario one is like or location one is the same as populous route location one predictable route location one but they each all have like their flavor to them as well which was wild to me when i played it the second time because i was like oh damn we're really doing this <laughs> Yeah, I put a lot of work into this scenario. Um, that's, that's that's also part of the reason I scrapped the fourth route is because there are like nine different, entirely different objectives mm-hmm. to play through with these story cards. And I, w- I was kind of scraping to figure if I could get more than nine and decided against it eventually. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, each one of these plays completely differently. Yep. Even And each one of these is uh, like... I think it's three locations for the first act, four locations for second and third act, and then five locations for the last act. Okay, here, let's... Harborside, are you... Yeah, Harborside Harborside always always stays there. Yeah, I remember that, that, because that's... That I was pretty happy with, just keeping it as, like, a single central location that didn't swap out just to be the... kind of familiar escape route for everyone to get to. Yeah, and then it's also, it's... uh, from a like you don't have to think about this as much i imagine like there is some thought because people print and play but from like a if you're like designing to ever print stuff like that saves you uh eight cards right yeah i don't have to have um eight or nine extra starting locations just for every scenario so yeah Yeah. and each one of these is um laid out as it would be on a map of the real world. I had to like use a bunch of old maps and just Google map to view nice. relatively the positions of these to each other and connect them that way. Yeah, so all of these are Google map images just with like a Photoshop filter? For the most part, because it's, it's kind of hard to find yeah. and, 1920s art of these. And I mean like that's like, like if, if you're doing that, I like do it. It's a smart way. It's like, it's, like stuff like this, it gets the vibe across, right? Like, yeah, as long as it's not like, oh, look, there's a plane flying by in yeah. the background. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. As, as long as you can find a decent enough image that looks like it could be in the 1920s, it's it's fine. As long as there's not, like, a pickup truck with yeah. a, a bunch of logos on it. Yeah. Um, do you have a favorite route? Uh, that's, that's a good question. I'm not sure I do because there's stuff about all, each of them I like. Yeah. Because if you go... Um, if you go like the, the slow route through Panama across the Pacific, you're more in deep one territory, mm-hmm. but the other ones have, uh, either more agents or just more complex problems to solve because like, if you on the most direct route, they're more prepared with, for you. So there's like people poisoning supplies and yep. sabotaging the, the engines and taking all these really complex ways to delay you. If you go the populist route, they they kind of have to make decisions on the fly. They're gonna 
blackmail an official. They're going to quick drag a, a, a boat out into the port to block you from leaving. Or, yeah. Which is each one I hoped was just interesting enough in its own way. Yeah. No, and they definitely are. Like, I, um, like, cause yeah, there's just a lot of cool stories that come from it. And it's, it's like a, I think I heard you once say that this is kind of like the, it's like search for Kadath, right? Where it's just like little maps with like their own stories and the stories are all really fun and they're a good hook. Yeah. A lot of people have compared this to search for Kadath and yeah. there, there definitely is a little inspiration behind that, but mm -hmm. I wanted to make it a bit more streamlined and a bit more of my own flavor. Yeah. And it's definitely like, I think the, it's fun because you can kind of see the journey and this is the one where, Oh yeah, yeah. I got to talk about, I also got to talk about this for a second because this just still blows my mind where the agenda is, uh, if this agenda advances, the scenario will end the scariest text you can see. And you're like, but how long is campaign? Like how long is this going to be? There's so much I need to do, but it keeps resetting, which is so elegant because once again, if you're printing this card in paper, it's one card as opposed to however many agendas you'd need, right? Yeah, saved on the design space there. But mm -hmm. it's also really flavorful because they're like they're closing in on you. They're trying to lay hands yep. on you and stop you from getting there. And it, but if you can slip out on the next boat before they get you, then they've lost all their progress to trying to stop you. Yeah, hell yeah. Yeah, no, that's really cool. Oh. Yeah. yeah uh, this one like one of my favorites too. Yeah, there's a lot to like that that could dive in, but I think this one if you're if you haven't played Cyclopean and you're watching this once again, spoilers, <laughs> what are you doing? But this one is like this one is like the a very shining point in an already great custom campaign. So like checking this one out is worth going in blind. So and there's also like we'd spent like this is like a video in itself talking about all nine routes, right? All nine locations. Yeah, it was it was not easy to decide what to do with each route sometimes. Mm -hmm. Cause like going through Panama, for example, is really, like, noteworthy. Everyone knows the Panama Canal, but, uh -huh. like, what landmarks does the Panama Canal have? Yeah. So I really had to, like, look around on Google Maps and see, like, oh, what's what's going on here? All right, it looks like there's a U.S. military base here. Was that active in the 1920s? I got to see. Oh, that's cool. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, is, I mean, and I think that, that shows, like, uh, respect you have. Like, because, like, would you, the respect you have for, like, the source materials when you're, uh, um adapting them it's cool to see that same kind of respect for real life and how it was and i imagine that's kind of just like how you take as well because you like the whole adapting the the written literature stuff or like the, the the movies books video games even um but like i it's cool to see that also transfer over into real world stuff yeah i love that it is a puzzle in itself just making it fit into the, yeah. the world that arkham horror has made i want this to be a compliment to it not just like a side thing that exists in its own space. Yeah, definitely. Sweet. Okay. Let's go on to blood from stones, which is another one that kind of just blows my mind because of the, the geometric seals. Which, yeah, this one. Yeah. I'll let you, <laughs> Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but this one was another kind of experiment. It was more like you, you've got to, to break out of this magic dome that they're basically keeping you in Singapore in. Mm -hmm. But how do you do that? And I decided, why not just have randomized ways that you need to break the barrier? Mm -hmm. Should they be in any specific order? Well, not particularly. Why not all three at once? Let's just throw you in there and see how you can handle three objectives at the same time. Yeah. And they are all the both times I played it, I looked at them and I was like, these seem impossible, but then they're not. It's it it blows my mind. I think like the the design you have on each of the seals is so tight and so doable. Well, when you see them for the first time, you're like, well, this is never gonna happen, right? It's it's really cool to see. Cause the second time, my first time I was like, well, this is hard. But then I did it, and I was like, well, that was easy. And then the second time, I was like, this is going to be impossible. And then I did it, and I was like, wow, that was actually pretty pretty good. It was like a fun time. It's it's just, I, I think, it just it sticks with me. 
Because every time, I, I both times I had that reaction, right? That's good. That's the kind of reactions I want to hear. Yeah, like even this G, this one right here, this top one. Like after hidden treasure location is discarded or removed from play. You're like, what the heck? But then if I remember correctly, like don't you have like locations that allow you to, or there's something that lets you like... Yeah, you've got either the harbor here or the convent here that lets you just test to add clues. Yeah. It's, it's a difficult test, but yeah. you can do it. But then like then the cenotaph, the... you can search the encounter deck for cards, which can help with like multiple of your quests here, which is really like just really nice. It's like the design is so tight in this. It blows my mind. It's it just it flabbergasts me. Thank you. I wanted to make sure that, well, it actually took a couple retries to make it a bit more involved, but I wanted to make sure that even though a lot of these are not something you can directly control. Mm -hmm. The locations have different things to help you. Like yeah. uh, this temple, it just you just keep revealing until you get those symbol tokens that you need. It's yes. gonna it's gonna cost you a little, but you, you can do it. Yeah. Or up here, if you're just completely stumped on one of them, you can just clear all the clues and it'll it'll make it harder to get this victory, but you can just progress the scenario that way. Yeah, yeah. No, there's a lot of uh I guess like it's safety valves in a way, right? But not really safety because it's just like like d different design knobs you've twisted to make all of these objectives a bit easier. Yeah, and people are who have specific play styles can still make use of the abilities here. Like, like let's say for example, um, what's a good one? Uh, if you have like this one, a deck where you just have testless stuff and you can't really reveal tokens easily without failing constantly mm -hmm. if you want to make some good headway then you can try one of the extra things on the locations to help progress that one specifically and focus on yep. the other ones in the meantime yeah definitely yeah and i like this one it's like there's like the passive ones there's ones that you like because they're all reaction effects they're all afters right but this one is just kind of like it just kind of like happens and you're like, okay, this one's nice and we can focus on this stuff, which is a bit more involved. But they all, once again, even though like you're like, this one seems easier than this one, for example, uh, it's not. They're like, they, they kind of scale all the same way. It's it's wild to me. It did take a lot of tweaking to make sure they were all roughly equivalent, yeah. but I'm very happy with it. Yeah, and I like, once again, the story with the Euclidean, the non-Euclidean rather, sorry, where it's uh, the Freemasons Hall, which, you know... Yeah, you just had a little experience at the last one. Yep, yep. So it's like, once again, kind of telling that story. Yeah. No, this is... I think this scenario, like, it's it seems more simple than the design that had to go into it, which is, I think is an impressive feat because there's a lot of moving pieces, but it doesn't feel like it when you're playing it. And that's why this one, like, sticks with me so much. It's it's a definite challenge, but it's the kind of puzzle that I enjoy. How do mm -hmm. I how do I simplify things without losing how elegant and robust they can be? Yeah, definitely. Because I want people to be able to play this without being frustrated, but at the same time, I don't want it to be like trivial. And it's actually to to look at to talk about Arkham incidents for a second. That's actually something that's kind of. Um, seems to be the case with the um the tetsuo one where it's there's the mystery that you have to solve and there's evidence on the cards but it's it it's still when you flip the thing at the end it's you just kind of like reveal the card right but it allows your players to solve the mystery themselves before it's even revealed which was really cool yeah i really love that scenario it may be one of the favorite ones that i've ever designed yeah it's a cool one uh, yeah, Blood from, Blood from Stones is pretty fun, and this is the first opportunity you get to reface a traitor plus this guy. Mm -hmm. And I had to include like this extra thing to attach to him if you're doing well, just so he's not a pushover. Yeah, yeah. So sick. Cool. Yeah, no, this one's a good one. I, I really like, I mean, like... Yeah, I like a lot of this campaign. There's a lot of good stuff. It's I'm excited to play it again soon. But this one, it it blows my mind. <laughs> I can't even fathom the steps that went into it. But as you said, it's just tweaking and experience and um, just doing it, right? Like, just throwing stuff out there and see what sticks. And, like, if it, if it doesn't work, 
don't be afraid to fix it or even scrap it if need be and change it completely, I imagine. Sometimes has to happen as well. Yeah, sometimes you do have to redo things from the ground up. It sucks, but if something isn't working, it's better than trying to make it work yep. for months and wasting effort. Yeah. All right. The penultimate scenario, pyroclastic flow. So this one's neat where you said that this one originally was two, but then you merged it into one. Yeah, I hadn't gotten fully into the design of the scenario yet, but I knew I wanted there to be a, a boat ride to the volcano. Yeah. And originally I thought like, well, a boat ride is just kind of its own thing. So I'll have that be a scenario and then I'll have this volcano be a scenario. But it didn't really need to be. Uh -huh. The more I thought about it, it's just like, well, you're not going to get a lot of variety from a, a one ship encounter the whole way. And when you're at the volcano, there's really only one thing you need to do when yes. you get there. Yeah. So I might as well just combine these. Yeah. And yeah. you and really don't need a lot of cards for the first act anyway, so it's not that bad. And it is kind of like an interesting, um, like, divide between them. Because you're right, they would feel kind of empty if they were each their own, or they would feel too bloated because you would need to add more things to it. But right now, both just kind of feel like small little tasks that also just tell the story of what's happening, right? Yeah, and Tsukimon was fun just because I wanted an, an extra guy to be in your corner. Yep. Because you've been going this pretty much alone, but it, it made more sense for the narrative the, for you to actually navigate your way to this volcano that you're, you're going to need a ship captain. Yeah. And rather than make just some generic faceless captain, I decided to make him somebody who you actually like and can interact with. Yeah. Once again, I think that's, uh, you can kind of, I can see that. I, I can see that now after you've told me this, even in your other designs, right? Like the whole, how you like these characters. And I'm like, okay, that makes sense. And now what I also love about doing these interviews for myself is being more like, oh, hey, there's a, I imagine this character Beard had a lot of fun, uh, designing and the story for, and the mechanic for, and the flavor for it. Yeah. Yeah. I, if you give the, the players the ability to interact with characters on their own terms, uh -huh. it really helps them like it more. Yeah. Because, like, if you have, like, the Dunwich series of, like, allies that you stuff into your deck and it's kind of disrupting things, like, well, thanks for showing up, Zeb, but I don't really need you right now. Yeah. Then you, you don't really care as much. It's just like, all right, here's a guy on the side who's helping us out. Well, thanks for coming. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Another one is uh, uh, if, uh, if you like this kind of thing for if you're designing, the tenuous allies that Jack Science didn't call the Plague Bearer was also really cool. Um, yes, another... that was that was a great way to basically put the whole city of Arkham in your corner. Yep, and that's a that's a mechanic that I would love to see them do in official stuff as well because it's it's very it's a very nice thing to like. I just remember when that you get the freaking agency backup, and I was like, "Are you kidding me? <laughs> this is incredible!" <laughs> yeah. Um, okay, so yeah, the the boat ride. This one is I like the whole like how there's the treacheries and locations. And then, like, it, it once again, it kind of, like, has that nice little simple, like, step thing. And I actually, I, I've, I see this in a lot of your other designs, too, where it's just, like, here's the thing, you do this, and it's just, like, the steps, and you can just see, like, you get to interact with it in different ways. Like, in the, the Dario Arkham incidents, where it's, like, you chase the people, and then eventually you've chased them enough, and you have to actually, like, this last guy is the one, and you have to get him into the corner, right? Like, there's that kind of just, like, simple kind of, like, it's, like, climbing up some steps slowly, but you're just, like, interacting with different pieces of, of that uh, mechanic on each step that you go up. Yeah, I like to I like to show the progress that players are making. So even in a long scenario, it feels like they're getting somewhere rather than, all right, it's been twelve rounds. Are we close to the end? I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I'm just gonna remind myself. Yeah, because then there's these ones, and I like once again like the the feeling and flavor of all of these. They're really fun, and then the treacheries for these. Some yeah, of them are yeah. going wild yeah. and these are just like strange places or just the cult is coming after you. Yep. Yeah, no, that's really cool. And then we get to the volcano. Here, let me get this aside here just so we can make room for it. Yeah, there's volcanoes. Yeah, the impossible summit because you get to the shore and then like uh, Sukiman leaves you then, right? He's like, I can't go up here. Like, I, I gotta watch the boat. Good luck, guys. Yeah. And then, like, it makes, yeah, it, it goes around, like... Yeah, you get, like, eight of those ten. And th this was really fun to play around with non-Euclidean, not just 
on the cards themselves, but with you like skipping the volcano essentially, and it makes it a smaller map than it looks. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, going around is really easy, and you can like make the right choices. And you yeah. have to keep going across to like figure out why is this volcano impossible to to actually climb. And I mean, like, like before your final scenario where you really put turn the non Euclidean into non Euclidean, this kind of is like the climax of the feeling of that, right? Where like location wise, you're telling a story that something strange is happening here mechanically, right? Yeah, and it's it's not even a volcano. It's a bunch of mismatched pieces of earth that have been shoved together to make an artificial volcano, essentially. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the the surviving cultists can show up here too, right? The order man? Yep, right at the summit there. And yeah. the fact that, like, four of the six are aloof kind of yeah. helps you manage that when they show up. Yes. Because they're a problem, but they might not just instantly execute you. Yeah, because that's what happened with me, where... I didn't have them, but there so many of them were aloof that I think all of them were. They were just kind of like hanging out here, right? And then yep. you're just like, it, it kind of like fits like, Halo, hey, we're here. But as I said earlier, it's like, we're not concerned with you. But some of them might be, right? Like good old Thorpe, Wallace Thorpe and Rodney Duval. Yeah, those two are the ones that are more active attackers. The others are just kind of helping the cult while staying on the sidelines yeah they're they're the kind of bosses that are the ones that sit at the office and tell you to do stuff yeah and i like it once again each of them have a little uh tagline to them that you know kind of floats that like expert assassin sigil sorcerer yeah they're more aggressive than fanatical mastermind <laughs> who just likes to sit and twirl his mustache <laughs> that's definitely a nice villainous mustache there yeah and I know with this one, there were changes. Um, a little bit, just yeah, to, I think it... it was from watching your playthrough that I discovered that I really didn't give the the fighters in the group enough to do here. Mm -hmm. So I kind of added a bit more for them. And it, it was a very nice change. I remember just like the second time I was like, yeah, this, it feel it felt like we're just right. You know, it's just like, okay, now it feels great. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love this whole setup. And again, this bakes into the, the story because, um, like, way back at the start here, uh, where's the campaign guide? Oh, up here. Uh, way back at the start here, it's um, page two, I think, the, with the prologue. This all happens November of 1927. I chose that specifically because I did a whole bunch of, bunch of math. Is like, all right. If I figure you do like a couple days to sort out the first half of the campaign where you're doing the mystery, mm -hmm. and then like a month and a half to travel across the world, mm -hmm. that should put you in the place you need to be roughly at New Year's. And New Year's just before 1928 was when Krakatoa Volcano was reforming. And that's why I chose the date for that. That's so really cool. So there's a, there's a lot of stuff that I love to find from the real world and put in there just to kind of add authenticity to it. Yeah, definitely. That's really cool. Yeah, that's awesome. Man, I like learning all these things. I would have no idea. I just see Volcano and I'd clap my hands. <laughs> that's so cool. <laughs> I mean, that that's fine too. If players enjoy an adventure on top of a Volcano, that's yeah. exactly why I built this. But maybe more for my satisfaction than anyone else's. I just like adding the extra flavor that yeah. some people may never realize. Well, the layers make it like, I think that's, it's the layers that like separate like the, the really good from, or like rather the excellence from the great, you know, like it's like those, like that attention to detail that really hammers that home. It's like that, the little, like the gravy on top, you know? Yeah. All right. Let's uh let's talk about the final one. Oh boy, what a finale. <laughs> it's it's a neat one. It's definitely like what I like about this one is that it's the most complicated. <laughs> but it like earns it after us a campaign which is relatively not complicated, right? So, and the funny thing for how complicated it is there's only like a quarter page of instructions for how it yeah. works. Yeah. 
It's mostly like the orientation is... It's easy to grok, but it's like... There's... You're like, am I doing it right? Because it's just so against what you normally do. So where would, where did the idea from this one start? For this one, it started with me trying to figure out, like, how do you really map out really A? Is it going to be like Lost in Time and Space, where it's just a bunch of locations that kind of sync up but not really? Mm -hmm. And I don't know when the idea struck exactly, but I thought, like, wait, have, have we ever rotated locations? Have we ever rotated Investigator mini cards? I don't think so. I think I'm going to use this to just show how completely weird the space of really is mm -hmm. definitely and this this is what um like i know some people might there might not be fans of it or like a good example is in call um in call of the plague bearer in scenario seven where you're going to the victory display <laughs> but custom yeah, that, was, that was really something but custom campaigns i in my opinion should explore like the design space further than official games do right because it's fun and number two the stakes are lower right like the stakes could never be lower right um yeah and if you're not going to experiment then who is yeah exactly right so it's even though while some people might be like why does my orientation matter the designer should be like why does orientation matter you know right exactly and i know a lot of people either love or hate this one yeah. because it, it, it is a brain bender you got to think for a while even if there isn't technically a lot going on in it mm -hmm. just the whole fact that you have to figure out you how to navigate really a is really fascinating for some people and really irritating for others yeah and i kind of accepted that with the design i knew that some people weren't going to like it but i still really wanted to do this yeah. As much as I like everyone to enjoy my works, sometimes you just got to do it for yourself. Oh, hell yeah. Hell yeah. And I, I, I like this one a lot because it, it is like a very interesting and unique puzzle. And what I love is that you made Cthulhu feel huge. Yeah, he's at multiple locations at once and you don't even know which location is going to be until the, the escape over reach flips. Yeah. Yeah, because then this is the yeah, so whenever I play this, is how I do it, and then I flip the ones that it is, so I can like see he's on this side and that side. Um. But like, and then when you evade him, you like you just like he's not like you you're hiding, and it stops him from looking in that direction, right? Exactly. It's really cool. I also love the whole victory. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's ironic that I made him one of the one of the ancient ones that you can't beat because I think in, in story, he's like one of the only ones that actually does get beat. Yeah. Cause they hit him with drive a boat. a boat into it. Yeah. <laughs> it is kind of funny how that works. It's probably just because like Cthulhu has a nice simple name, but he also has like such a good look, right? Like his look is his design is just really good. Yeah, he's, he's the squid dragon. Everybody knows him. Yeah. But yeah. And then this is the one also, cause does this one have the, yeah. Warp stone work. Which... Yeah, and that's that's the whole reason I had like Ruins of Relia really and Cyclopean Acropolis separated. Yeah. Because no matter how many locations you're able to go to, I need to make sure that there were these two that were not connected to, to any of these locations just to make sure that you could yeah. have somewhere to go. Yeah. And then this, this one... Oh, sorry. Because this go. isn't connected to any of these warped islands. There's just an action on here that you can move directly to them yeah. from here. Yeah. Yeah. And the non the I like the non Euclidean to shuffle your deck. Yeah, just just something to screw with you. You know something's wrong, but nothing's technically gone wrong yet. Yeah, unless you're of course Leo with doomed. And yeah, and then these ones all have the non Euclidean, which is just like like all about rotating your character, uh, your mini card, um, or discard, or like the, there's the alternatives that come with it because there's the whole mechanic of where. Um, there's there's the stuff that like this one for example i think it's this one this one is one of the ones that were like it like the your graveyard matters and then there's things that like remove stuff from your deck basically as you're just like being whittled down by all the madness down here archaic evils is one of the most i'm not sure if it's contentious or 
what the right word is, but there are some people that thought like th this isn't even a choice. I'm going to remove three cards every time. And there's some people that are just like, I am paralyzed because I don't know whether that's important enough to save these three cards. And, and honestly, it's only three cards. I think that is a sign of good design, right? Actually, had someone told me that it was a bad design because it made him want to choose Doom. No, that's great. That's so good. Because <laughs> it's like they're like. Like how like there's like in like the film industry where like a movie comes out and it hits every quadrant, you know, like kids, adults, old people, like, like everyone. This is like the kind of thing where this can hit, this hits a different player archetype quadrant that like for me, I'll remove the cards like 90% of the time. Right. But yeah, unless you get like, you're playing a rogue deck and there's two of your exceptional items in that set of three. Yeah. Or, like, there's combo players, where this is, like, a nightmare, right? And I think that it's good. I think that if a, a treachery only targets every archetype broadly, it'll be a weaker treachery than one that will eventually just be a nightmare, right? For in the right moment. Yeah. So, yeah. And it's hard to hit that sweet spot, because some people aren't going to care about it. Some people will just power through, and some people will be absolutely miserable if they choose wrong yeah yeah uh, but it's it's a puzzle this game is a puzzle no matter how much people don't think it is yep i agree with that completely but yeah i think this is a good it's our only um i also love the whole maybe evaded with brain as well um it's these kind of like once again like a little safety valve right to make sure that everyone can contribute yeah it's and it's saving multiple people if you happen to be at the yes the wrong set of locations or there's a chance that he just might be in a different part of the island than you and you're safe this round oh yeah the 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 the, the flavor in my head of just him like lurking around and he's just like looking somewhere else it's like like in an arkham asylum where like scarecrow the the nightmare yeah. sections it has those kind of vibes it's really cool yep <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I, I like the scenario. I like the puzzle. Like you said, I like. I can see why people don't, but I do like the whole. How can I take the actions in enough succession to make sure I'm in the right place at the right time to start progressing the game? Yeah. Yeah, it's 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 my kind of scenario. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you have a favorite in the um, campaign, or do you just love all your children equally? I won't say I love them all equally. There's definitely some that I like better, but uh, I think Across Dreadful Waters is my favorite just because of how it plays out. Yeah, the scope and the scale and just how um, elegant it feels while still having a lot to it is very impressive. Yeah, I'm, I'm re always really proud of the ones that I can have something interesting happen while still being really simple. Yeah. I just, simplicity is elegance. I forget what that quote is too, but they're right. <laughs> sick this makes me want to play cyclopean again maybe i'll Good. do that maybe i'll do that next tuesday <laughs> <laughs> you definitely could yeah um any other general thoughts that uh we didn't touch on because we didn't just touch on a lot i think i covered everything i wanted to talk about and just uh yeah i mean i really appreciated being able to get further insight into how you design and also knowing the amount of detail that you go in on everything is kind of wild to me. I, I love it. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a labor of love. I'm I'm glad there's such a good community around Arkham because if I was just left to making homebrews to myself, I probably would have just stopped after Alice. Yeah, yeah. Because it's it, it's good to see people enjoying what I what I make. It's yeah. just making something for the sake of making it is fine and all, but. Uh, to have people actually like really be impressed and enjoying the scenarios. That's the main reason that I designed for the Arkham here. It's, it's definitely a point of pride for me. Uh, and I see that the, I forgot about this, the epilogue, the, with the, the notice. I see you came here to do look at this on the, the show this off. I think the last little bit, I, I forgot about this. Like the, if you have enough notice, there's someone following you even after the campaign is a really cool finish. Yeah, that, that was just a, a fun thing because most people aren't going to continue after the fact, but just there, there's some person following you that you never knew was part of the cult. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Oh, that reminds me, but before we get too far from it, at the start of uh, Across Dreadful Waters when Ernie comes to collect. Yep, yep, yep. The, <laughs> the payoff to that that one line of text. I love it. It's great. And you get like... Um, and you can like, <laughs> you can choose, right? So it's not that bad, but I love it. even just the indebted. You're like, all right, you got it, <laughs> you got it. Fine, take the money, or yeah. you can, you can run for it, and he'll send the mob and force it after you across the world. Yeah, or he'll, or you can just fight it out right there, and they'll beat the crap out of you, but you're you're done with it. <laughs> yeah, and this this yeah, that's that's so, it's like it's once again like the, the stuff that I think, we love Carcosa for, but we don't talk about is like this. Like, the, the box office, the long-term small things. But then also, even going back to your epilogue, where there's, there's that last little bit at the end of Carcosa, right? If you hit a very specific set of circumstances. Which is, it just, it, it feels like a story, you know? It feels like a story. And, like, it keeps going after it's done. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's definitely what drew me into making stuff for this game, because... I love the stories that Arkham tells uh -huh. and that, and that's the reason why I haven't made any homebrew whatsoever for like Arkham horror, the board game or Eldritch horror, because they're, they're fine. They're fun games, but the story isn't what I'd like it to be. Arkham horror is, is the, the game that I want to make. It's the game that I want to play. Uh -huh. Hell yeah. And uh, yeah, well, I'm, I'm very excited to, uh, cause there's, yeah. Cause you have Oz, which is that one out or is that one? Oz is out. Oz, Oz is has out. been released. It's, it's still in like version one, but yeah. it's definitely in a playable state. Nice. And, and then right you... now I'm working on Half-Life yep. Yep. with both my friends who shout out to them, put up with a whole lot of my designs in their beta state <laughs> to make them playable for the world. Yeah. Um, but they're both interested in sci-fi, so they're on board to help nice. make uh, Half-Life rather than it just being my own thing. And Circus X Mortis is further down the line and I may have a couple other ideas other than that. Nice. Yeah, there's there was one I, I know you I, I don't wanna I don't wanna step on any of your toes and like talk about anything you might be doing, but there was one that you brought up in our in our Arkham Custom on our Discord and it it really intrigued me, the one that I got the most votes for from our from our community anyway. Oh, it it got the most votes in every community. I did it in the Mythos Buster server, and yeah. I think there were like twenty total votes, and it got eighteen of them. <laughs> wow! Yeah, no, it's it's a it's a very cool idea, and color me very intrigued. <laughs> yeah, I'm still gathering ideas for that right now, but yeah. uh, I definitely want to follow through on that just because it'll it'll add a lot of yes replayability to the game. I think. Yeah, definitely. Cool. Well, thank you so much for doing this. I had a great time, and I'm looking forward to doing it about Alice once I get my second play of that one done. No problem. Thank you for interviewing me. It's been a it's a great time, and you have a, a community that I'm very happy to be a part of. Oh, thank you. I'm gonna now do my go into my YouTube voice and say goodbye to everyone. So, uh, join me as I say thank you, everybody, for watching. Much appreciated. I'll if I remember, I'll have a link to the Cyclopean Foundation's workshop. Uh, for on Steam down in the description. If it's not there when you're watching this and you're listening to me, yell at me in the comments and I will put it in. Uh, thanks so much for watching. A huge thank you to all of our patrons and for everyone who uh, has just supported our community for so long. Have a good one. And as always, a GG's.